Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar which is part of London International Disputes Week and is hosted by Herbert Smith Freehills and Quadrant Chambers. So this evening we're going to be focusing on the future of oil and gas disputes. My name is Rachel Lidgate, I'm a partner at HSF and the disputes team. Um, we've got a lot of interesting stuff to cover so without delay I'm going to proceed to introduce today's panel to you. First we have Simon Rainey QC of Quadrant Chambers uh, he probably know, needs no introduction to you, but is one of the preeminent commercial silks we have in London and certainly has a very significant track record in the energy sector. Second, we have James Robson, who is a senior associate in the disputes team at HSF, and he's going to be talking about LNG, which is an area that uh, I think has suffered particular pressures over the last 12 months. And we're then going to turn to uh, Louise Barber and Chris Parker, who are a senior associate and partner respectively in our specialist international disputes team. And they are going to focus on decarbonisation, which is a very large area, but in particular looking at what that means for disputes in the oil and gas sector going forward. So we've got a lot to get through. In terms of housekeeping, please do put any questions into the, the Q&A box and we will endeavour to turn to them at the end of the session. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much indeed, Rachel, for that kind introduction and a very good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure uh, to be addressing uh, you this afternoon, and it's an honour also to share uh, the platform with such heavy hitters from Herbert Smith Freehills. As you can see from the title of my slide, I'm going to be talking about uh, upstream oil and gas contractual disputes. And upstream contracting parties are frequent users of the commercial court here in London. And 2020 and 2021 have proved no exception to that rule. Everyone will have their own choice of favourite cases, but I've picked four I think of the most interesting in the last year. And I want to ask myself rhetorically, you the audience, for participation perhaps afterwards, and my co-panel uh, colleagues, if we are starting to see a constant theme in the interpretation of contracts and the, the, the resolution of upstream contractual disputes, with variations for sure, but a theme all the same. I've only got time to do a handful of cases, so if we can have the next slide, please. Thank goodness for that, the slide came up. Uh, um, I'm going to talk about four cases, I'll just tell you what they are and what they're about, and then we'll, we'll get down into them. The first is Taka Britani and Rockrose. That concerned a JOA. Then British Gas and Shell and Esso, that concerned a long term take or pay gas contract. Apache North Sea and INEOS, a TPA, Transportation and Processing Agreement. <clears throat> and then Apache again, busy users of the commercial court last year, and Euroil Exploration concerning two agreements, interestingly, a farm out agreement and another JOA. So let's start with our first case. Next slide, please. Taka Britani and Rockrose. Uh, there are the uh, um, logos of the various uh, uh, protagonists and a picture of the Brayfields, chart of the Brayfields. Uh, and this was a, a falling out between participants in, in, uh, under a JOA and the operator. Next slide, please. So Taka was one of four participants uh, in a number of JOAs relating to the Brayfields. And the initial operator was uh, Marathon Oil company and the judge described as being a very substantial worldwide experience in various sectors of the energy sphere. Rockrose bought the share capital of Marathon Oil, which was then snappily re renamed Rockrose UKSC 8. And there was a slight issue there because Taka itself had bid for Marathon, but was rejected by Marathon. There then ensued a challenge because the participants said they had serious concerns about the performance of Marathon Oil as operator before the sale to Rockrose and the ability of what became Rockrose to perform the role of operator under the JOAs from an operational and economic perspective. The participants said that it was in Tacker's best interest, i.e. Tacker the participant, to become the operator of the Rayfields, which it would have done and uh, Marathon accepted his bid. And so the participants simply removed Rockrose uh, as uh, operator by unanimous resolution under the JOA clause 19.1a. Next slide, please. This was in one sense, a little bit of unfinished business between the participants and Marathon Oil stroke Rockrose, as it became, 
because some of you will remember the leading case in 2019 between Tacker and Marathon Oil, same JOAs, where uh, the uh, Tacker and the other participants protested at the, the operator charging them with a pension deficit for employees engaged in the joint operations. And that case went up to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal construed it in a very, very textual way and dismissed the challenge based on what was alleged to be a failure to curb runaway costs by a marathon. And that's an important decision in holding the, the, the hold neutral principle is very important as between participants and the operator. But that was enough of that case. Let's turn back to 2020. Next slide, please. The change of operator clause, I put it up on the screen there, was sparse in its simplicity. Operator may be discharged at the end of any calendar month by the operating committee giving not less than 90 days notice to it, provided that, and then certain voting percentages had to be observed. All of, the, all of those requirements were met. Interestingly, and the judge pointed out it was an interesting sidelight, 19.3 allowed the operator to resign from acting as operator uh, simply on giving six months written notice. And so as the judge held, uh, the right to resign, just like the right to dismiss or discharge, wasn't subject to any express qualifications. And so uh, um, uh, Rockrose had to cast around for some uh, implied restrictions on the change of operator. Next slide, please. And so Rockrose came up with these two arguments. It said that Tacker was motivated solely or mainly by a desire to take over the operator role for its own commercial and financial purposes. Well, that was a given because that's what Tacker was saying that it, it needed to do. They said that that was an illegitimate consideration for the participants. And there were two limitations on the right to discharge the operator. The first they relied upon was what was called the Braganza principle, uh, based on that important case about contractual discretions and contractual decision making, Braganza and BP shipping about the uh, BP uh, uh, deck officer who uh, disappeared overboard a ship. And there was an issue about whether his wife, should, his widow, should recover a death benefit. And the Supreme Court held that in certain circumstances, there would be implied terms qualifying the manner in which a discretion or a decision making process should be exercised, requiring the absence of arbitrariness, perversity and irrationality. That was the first point they, they, they sought to run. The second point was that they said this was a relational contract. I'll come back to what that means in a moment. Uh, and that there were principles of good faith. Uh, uh, which meant that the right under Clause 19 1A had to be exercised in good faith and not in breach of mutual trust and confidence, because a long term joint venture and a long term contract like a JOA was a relational contract. And they, they sought to pray in any of that, that, that decision, which has troubled a lot of people, decision of Mr. Justice Leggett in Yamsen, an international trade corporation, as far back as 2013. Next slide, please. The judge, and this is, I think, what makes this case so interesting, the judge started by, by considering the contractual interpretation techniques to be employed to a, an energy contract, upstream contract, like a JOA. And he said that the starting point was in determining the meaning and effect of the JOAs, because the parties have the control over the language which they use, and they must have been specifically focusing on the issue in question. And then he said this, and I've highlighted the words in red. This is of particular importance with contracts such as the JOAs because they are sophisticated and complex agreements drafted by skilled and specialist professionals. Therefore, you construe JOAs principally by textual analysis. So focus on the text because you've got highly sophisticated agreements with highly sophisticated uh, parties to them. The judge held that the language was clear and unambiguous. There were no express qualifications at all. It was simply a binary exercise. You either discharge or you don't. And as the judge said, there is no evaluatory or adjudicatory exercise that they are required to undertake before they're entitled to take the decision. With that introduction, he then turned to attackers, uh, sorry, to Rockrose's two arguments. Next slide, please. The first was the Braganza principle. And he said the Braganza principle was an implied term and it wasn't necessary to imply the term to make the right to discharge the operator work because the right to discharge the operator was an unfettered right. So why do you need to imply, import a fetter uh, 
to make it work better. You don't. It's actually contrary to the working of the right to discharge the operator. And interestingly, because Braganza comes up over and over again in upstream contract disputes where there's a decision making power or a discretion, the judge said that where you have expert and complex provisions actually dealing with the topic, it's wrong to try to unpick them by importing a Braganza principle. As the judge said, I think importantly, that would have profound implications for English commercial and contract law. The certainty of the text was all. So what did he think about the second argument, relational contracts and the Yang saying good faith debate? Again, this is something that's always been, been trotted out in, in contractual disputes, uh, as much in the upstream contract field as elsewhere. The judge highlighted where the Yam Seng principle doesn't apply. The key to understanding the circumstances in which a good faith obligation is to be implied in, in, into a, a relational contract is that the parties have not legislated for that position in the express terms of the contract. Therefore, you have to look at the implied good faith to work out what the obligation is. And where the parties have actually written it out and spelled it out, there is no room. Now, unfortunately, the judge didn't uh, address once and for all whether a JOA is a relational contract in the Yang Seng sense, but he was content to treat the JOA as arguably relational. And then he said that he would not imply an implied duty of good faith because the parties had legislated for it directly in clause 19.1a, therefore you didn't need to try and hunt around for what the term was in good faith terms, and it was completely unnecessary given the meaning of the clause. Next slide please. So that's the first case, and I think it's an important case for JOAs and energy agreements generally because of the focus on drafting. The next case is British Gas Trading and Shell and Esso. Here is a picture on the one side, of the uh, Soul Pit Reservoir, the picture has quickly disappeared, and Pyrrhus on the other side, because this is a case of a Pyrrhic victory for British gas trading in the Court of Appeal. This can concern the long-term gas contract under which British gas was obliged to take or pay for gas based on a, 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 a concept known as the total reservoir's daily quantity. That was a capacity obligation on uh, the um, Shell and Esso, uh, and the TDRQ could change over the life of the contract as the field uh, was depleted. Following the end of a certain period, the minimum plateau period, the sellers had the right to serve a variation notice, which if served would re reduce the TRDQ. So as the capacity went down, the sellers had the right, but not the obligation, to reduce the TDRQ. They didn't. What they did instead, uh, was uh, although they were obliged to maintain a physical capacity of, of, of available gas in the quantity of the TDRQ, they didn't do so, but they supplied gas anyway from pooled gas. The judge at first instance held that the British, uh, British gas lost on breach, uh, 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 but won on damages. When it went to the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal held that British gas won on breach, but lost on damages because uh, British Gas had no right to require Shell to serve a variation notice so as to reduce the TDRQ. And as one judge said, that was fatal to the buyer's case on loss. Next slide, please. In British Gas and Shell and, and Esso, Braganza was run again. Uh, and it, this was in relation to the, the right to serve the variation notice. I've set out the clause there. If in any contract year, the seller is of the opinion that it would be unable to maintain throughout the specified contract year, the TDRQ, the seller may serve a, a notice reducing the TDRQ. <clears throat> As it was argued in that case, well, that, that must be subject to a Braganza term. You, you actually have to reduce it if you can't meet it. it. It's not a question of may, it's a question of must because of the Braganza duty to do so reasonably. And Lionel Percy, the city is the judge at first instance, rejected that very much for the same reasons we've just seen the judge rejecting it in the Tacker and Britanni case. If these sophisticated and experienced parties wished to incorporate an annual review clause, it would have been easy to do so. It is not, in my judgment, appropriate to rewrite the party's bargain by introducing such mechanism by the back door. So another implied term and another Braganza argument not doing very well. But they had another argument up their sleeve. Next slide, please. 
and that was to rely upon commercial common sense. Uh, effectively, the argument was, well, it's absolutely fatuous to believe that they can remain in continuous breach until the end of the contract, not ex extracting anything from the reservoirs, and yet still lo locking us into paying and taking, taking or paying for gas, which, which uh, uh, is completely out of the market on price. Lord Justice Mayles importantly said that he doubted whether commercial common sense has any role to play in the construction of detailed and expert, expertly drafted contracts, such as those in issue here. That I think is quite an important statement. Similarly, uh, Lord Justice Peter Jackson said that although the re result of the express terms of the contract was deeply counterintuitive, every contract contains levers of power. And the way in which the levers are dis distributed in this contract arose from commercial negotiation between parties who are well able to look after their own interests. We may have a very detrimental effect for one rather than the other party, but that's what they agreed, and it's not for the court to fiddle around with it by fine-tuning it to arrive at a different result. Next slide, please. The third case is uh, Apache and Ineos. The big rubber stamp saying declined is because it concerned a, a, a consent not to be unreasonably withheld clause. Next slide, please. And this was a, a, a case about a long-term TPA, transporting and processing agreement from the North Sea Forties fields via INEOS pipelines. And Apache had a right to apply to increase transportation if there was uncommitted capacity in the pipelines. INEOS was not allowed to unreasonably withhold its consent to such an increase. Apache applied for an increase and INEOS said, well, we're willing to consent, but only if we renegotiate and change the tariff uh, uh, under which we're uh, obliged to allow you to, access to, uh, to have access to the pipelines. The judge held that they were not entitled to impose such a condition. Next slide, please. And again, relational contracts were to the fore. Uh, um, the parties uh, referred to a decision of uh, the Court of Appeal in Amy Birmingham Highways, where the, the Court of Appeal took a very odd approach to complex language. Any relational contract of this character is likely to be massive length, containing many infelicities and oddities, not a compliment for the expert drafters on both sides. Both parties should adopt a reasonable approach in accordance with what is obviously the long-term purpose of the contract. They should not be latching on to the infelicities and oddities in order to disrupt the project and maximise their own gain. And that, I think, is a rather forlorn hope, given the sums that are usually at stake. But the judge in Apache and Ineos, Mr Justice Foxton, uh, uh, was very dismissive of that approach, and in my view, uh, correctly. Even long-term contracts uh, are, are risk allocational, uh, and he wasn't assisted by uh, attempts to say there's a special interpretive approach. The longer the longer term the contract gets, you would get a bit more fluid and more flexible with how you interpret the terms. Next slide, please. And so in relation to the actual issue before him on not unreasonably withholding consent, I really do recommend this to you if you have that, that clause or you're considering a, a dispute involving such a clause. Those clauses are very, very common in, in upstream contracts. And Mr Justice Foxton gave a very, very good analysis of how they work. And, and he said that you, you should not be trying to cut down uh, the, uh, the, the right uh, um, which is being um, subject to the consent by trying to construe that the consent has all sorts of special uh, uh, facilities and requirements. As he said, it, it may be legitimate for the consent provider to impose a condition to protect a benefit which it enjoys under the contract which it's about to lose or will be diminished, but it's certainly not right to impose a, 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 a condition which actually impairs a right which the, part, which the party applying for, con, for consent already has. Uh, here, um, under this contract, Apache had a right to send its gas at a particular tariff, and it was not uh, open, therefore, to INEOS to try to rewrite the tariff because that was a right which Apache already enjoyed. Next slide, please. And then to my last case, uh, with which I want to conclude uh, this little uh, this little part of the uh, of the presentation. Apache North Sea and Ural. Here you see two people trying to put jigsaw pieces together. And the reason I put that picture here is because this uh, case concerned the interaction of two contracts. Next slide, please. So Apache concluded a farm out agreement between Apache as seller and Ural for the sale of various interests in, in a block on the UK continental shelf. Apache also became operator 
under JOA with URIL and others in relation to the same block. Under the FOA, Apache was entitled without limitation to recover all drilling costs. But under the JOA, drilling costs recoverable by Apache as operator were capped. Apache said, well, don't, don't look at the, uh, don't look at the um, JOA, just look at the FOA. And under the FOA, I'm entitled to my full costs. That's my price under the contract uh, uh, of sale. And therefore, uh, the cap is irrelevant. Next slide, please. The Court of Appeal rejected very firmly uh, Apache's separate contracts arguments, saying that where you had farm out agreements and an allied joint operating agreement, you needed to construe them together so as to interact together appropriately to avoid inconsistencies and to minimize the prospect of dispute. And it was therefore wrong in principle to treat the FOA and the JOA, both relating to the same block, as entirely separate contracts with Apache wearing one hat here and one hat there, uh, the contracts had to be construed together in their proper context as a cohesive whole. They've been concluded together. And therefore, to try to construe the FOA as if it stood completely alone and in isolation and, and, and put the JOA out of your mind was what the Court of Appeal described as an ex post facto theoretical argument that does not reflect the true nature, nature of the parties dealing at the time and therefore they were read together as a package. Next slide, please. And so I end by asking the question I started with, are we seeing different themes, discordant music in contractual interpretation of upstream contracts, or are we seeing one theme with subtle variations like the Haydn variations or the Paganini variations, or one contractual interpretive theme? I want to suggest that what we're seeing now it, it, it are variations on a, on a theme, and the, the, the theme has three variations, and perhaps I can put the, my last slide up. The, the, the takeaways from 2020, I think, are these. First of all, the importance of, of, of the relevant provision being part of a standard industry form, AIPN JOA agreements, OJ UK standard form agreements, or in a contract modeled upon a standard form. You look at the text much, much more when you're construing such an agreement. And that echoes, I think, what we're seeing in non-energy contexts. Uh, for example, the approach of the court in, in relation to financial instruments in La Mesa and Synergy, also a case from last year, 2020, which is well worth reading. Secondly, sophisticated drafting. The importance of the relevant provision uh, uh, you're construing being in the context of a heavily lawyered agreement, very, very complex and lengthy, between two very sophisticated parties who should know what they're doing. They may not, but they should do. Uh, that sometimes can be overstated. There's a, a put up on the slide a, a case if you want to go the other way, Teesside Gas Transportation in Cats North Sea, a case I was involved in in 2019, where that approach was tempered slightly. But I think it is a theme that is loud and clear in 2020. And secondly, and uh, thirdly, uh, the, those two principles will be tempered with reality. You, you can't just look at the text, although you are looking at the text, and, and ignore the fact that contracts, especially upstream, are often made in suites with, with uh, uh, different contracts covering different aspects, but relating to the same block or the same interests. In those circumstances, literal text would approach, while, it, while in, in the starting point has to give way to trying to read the clauses together. That's all I wanted to say. It'd be interesting to hear what your views are on, on variations on a theme. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Rachel. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and uh, I think there are some questions that we might put to you, but uh, we'll, we will save those for the end. Um, so uh, I'll now hand over to James, who's going to talk about LNG. It's quite, quite different in some ways, but I, I suspect some of the similar themes might emerge. James. Thanks very much, Rachel, and, and thank you, Simon, for that really interesting review across a range of contracts. As Rachel said, I'm going to change sl uh, tack slightly and just going to focus on disputes arising out of one category of contract, and that's long-term LNG uh, sale and purchase agreements. I'm going to start by just outlining what, what these contracts are very briefly and why I think they're relevant uh, to a session on the future of oil and gas disputes. First of all, what they are, well, some LNG is certainly traded under 
short-term contracts or medium-term contracts or even on the spot market. Globally, the majority of LNG is sold under long-term uh, gas sales agreements, usually lasting 20, 30 years or, or more. And this really is a global market. LN LNG is produced uh, all over the world, bought in Europe and predominantly actually uh, by Asian countries, so Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and increasingly uh, China and India. Now, these contracts come across our desk in London because usually they are governed either by New York law or by, uh, by English law. So uh, whilst the dispute uh, might relate to, um, uh, or might be very global in nature, they are, uh, we are uh, looking at them as, um, as they're governed by English law. Now, unlike many of the upstream agreements which Simon has just talked about, actually, interestingly, there aren't any sort of standard form or uh, industry uh, drafted LNG sales agreements. But that said, these contracts do typically share common features, which means that they do give rise to similar issues. And the reason why I'm talking about them today, and this is uh, one of the points that I'll explore, is that we have seen these contracts give rise to a number of disputes over the last 12 months in particular, and certainly in my view, will continue to be a source of disputes in the future. And one reason for that is that these are often very valuable contracts indeed. At current oil prices, a single cargo of LNG is worth around $20 million. Under the largest of these agreements, there can be dozens of cargoes committed each year for a long period of time. So clearly the prize, or the potential prize, is large for a buyer or a seller if they are able to test the contractual limits of their contract. So just turning to the next slide, as Simon did, I'm going to review the sorts of disputes that have been, uh, that have come up in this area over the last uh, 12 months or so, before then going on to identify some uh, future trends. But unfortunately, unlike Simon, I don't have the benefit of um, public court decisions to help me. Disputes under these kind of contracts are notoriously uh, private affairs, resolved usually in arbitration or in expert determination. But that said, there are certain trends that can be identified, both from my experience working on these cases over the last year, and also from reports that are in the public domain. So the first type of dispute that I wanted to focus on is just FM disputes. And if we cast our mind back to this time last year, where we were obviously in the teeth of the pandemic, and for buyers under these contracts who had committed to receive large volumes of LNG, they were placed in difficulties. Commercially, there was a collapse in downstream demand for gas in many regions, which meant there was a, a lot of oversupply of LNG in the market. And whereas with another type of fuel, fuel, you might be able to say, well, let's just store it for a period of time. Actually, with LNG, technically, that's extremely difficult. And actually, there's very low or very little uh, uh, gas storage capacity in Asia. And the combination of those two circumstances led to problems because a lack of storage capacity at the intended destination under these contracts quickly made the contract actually impossible to perform because the LNG could not physically be unloaded from uh, the vessels. And that in turn led buyers and sellers to really scrutinize the FM provisions that are in these contracts. And, and we know that that led to uh, FM uh, claims by buyers uh, in China and in India um, uh, against their suppliers. Now we know and we all know that force majeure clauses turn on the specific language of the contract in question, but just in this particular situation, it was an interesting one, but it was by no means straightforward to make out an FM claim. And if your contract, as many did, referred to a pandemic as an FM event, then that certainly was the start of the analysis, but it wasn't the end of it. The pandemic had caused a loss in demand in domestic markets. In turn, that had caused uh, a low storage capacity, which in turn had caused an inability to perform the contract. And that was the event which was 
uh, potentially being relied on as the FM event. The question which came up, very difficult question, was did all the links in that chain of causation really stack up to make a, a legitimate FM claim? Or could any of the bricks, as it were, be pulled out and uh, the FM, FM claim would fall over? The next uh, type of dispute we saw actually beyond the FM provision in these contracts uh, uh, was related to other contractual mechanisms uh, for flexibility. And flexibility at this time was absolutely key. So parties were really testing the limits of their contract. Uh, a flexibility either as to volume, as to price. So there are often clauses in these contracts giving cancellation rights or allowing parties to defer cargoes or, or flexing downwards committed um, uh, quantities. And, and as I say on the slide, in particular, we found there's a real scrutiny on diversion or destination restriction clauses. And just by way of background, these contracts can often and do often have built into them territorial restrictions where they specify that uh, uh, cargoes can only be delivered to a particular destination or the diversion rights for cargoes from that destination are restricted, usually in order to prevent buyers taking advantage of arbitrage opportunities elsewhere, or at least to require the buyer and the seller to share any profit that might be made. Now, scrutiny of these clauses took place in the FM context too, because uh, uh, could a party divert cargoes if it wanted to, or equally on the other side of the coin, uh, uh, was there actually a requirement to try to divert um, if you wanted to claim FM sort of as an act of mitigation? Now, in part, it was a practical question. Actually, very few markets were um, uh, accepting diverted LNG uh, at around this time last year. There was also a legal question. Clauses permitting diversion had to be, had to be construed as a matter of English law uh, in, in the usual way. But just one interesting point that, that uh, uh, came up was about actually antitrust and competition issues and the extent to which these destination diversion restrictions might actually be anti-competitive and so the provisions themselves are uh, unlawful. And this was something that was addressed by the EU uh, a few years ago and actually these kind of clauses were actually deleted and phased out from uh, contracts um, being sold where energy was being sold into the EU really was a live issue and still is a live issue in Asian markets and in 2017 the Japanese Fair Trade Commission investigated the sort of legality uh, under competition laws of, of these kind of restrictive clauses. Its report weren't definitive and that therefore gave room for parties to actually look to see what well, could these clauses be challenged um, at, at, under at local competition laws. The third uh, sort of dispute that we saw actually arose out of take or pay clauses. And Simon touched on this when he was talking about the BGT decision, these kind of contracts obviously being construed by English courts as well. The take or pay provision essentially says if you're a buyer, you either take and pay for the LNG in a year, or if you don't take it, you have to pay for it in any event. And there are mechanisms which uh, guarantees a level of project revenues. Easily described in general terms, but as we found with FM provisions, actually, once you delve into the detail of any particular, uh, of the particular drafting in a contract, actually, there's always peculiarities. And the main points that, that, that came up were, well, how does the take or pay liability actually accrue? Does it accrue gradually as the year goes on on a cargo by cargo basis? Or is it just one reconciliation at the end of the year? And actually, if you're a buyer and you pay rather than take, well, does that give you an entitlement to make up gas? Usually yes, uh, but not always. And is there any restrictions on when and how you can cash out that balance of uh, make up gas which you've accrued? So actually these clauses, I mean, often they sit at the heart of these long-term LNG sale and purchase agreements, but actually in our experience, they're uh, uh, rarely uh, tested and actually it may be that the complexities that I've just described are one of the reasons why parties are keen not to actually um, uh, put these uh, uh, under the test uh, of an arbitration. Uh, fourthly and, and lastly, 
it saw we saw buyers looking at their contractual rights to review the price and almost all modern long-term contracts contain a price review clause which is essentially a contractual mechanism allowing a party to seek to change the price where there's been significant market changes which means that the contract price no longer reflects the bargain originally struck between the parties usually three elements to these sort of clauses there needs to be a trigger there's a process to be followed and there's a methodology to be applied and uh, at each stage uh, uh, disputes can arise and uh, it's partly because the whole point of these or one of the points of these clauses is to deal with changes in the market which were unforeseen when the contract was entered into so inevitably there's flexibility built into the drafting and that also means there's often scope for disputes as to what that drafting actually means so just turning to my last slide which is those are the current disputes what does the future look like under these sorts of contracts i've loosely grouped the themes or the threads that i've identified into three categories uh, uh, broadly speaking, a short term, a medium term and a long term outlook. And just in the short term, I think it's inevitable that we'll see these force majeure type uh, trading type disputes sort of playing themselves out. Uh, as I said, arbitration is the dispute resolution forum no normally, so they'll be conducted behind closed doors, unlikely to know what the answer is, which is a shame because they give rise to really interesting points of law. Um, uh, uh, the other reason they're unlikely to see the light of day is actually that these are long-term agreements, long-term relationships, usually or often as a path to some sort of renegotiation. And that might be in the form of a side letter or a formal variation or temporary uh, amendment. And actually, I was interested listening to Simon's observations about the approach courts will take to construing um, a, a, a agreements where you have a, a sort of suite of contractual documents in the background because certainly some of the agreements that were made um, uh, uh, have been made over the last year uh, create a potentially quite messy contractual background against which any any clauses will have to be construed in the future secondly in the more medium term absolutely see price views remaining a, a feature of disputes under energy contracts particularly but not exclusively in the uh, Asian market, uh, inevitably they will reflect some of the COVID related market change we've seen in the last year. But actually one interesting point I just wanted to uh, uh, briefly uh, address is that actually some reporting from Bloomberg, which I've read says that contracts covering about 30% of global LNG demand are expiring in the next four or five years. So actually, I mentioned earlier that you, you have to trigger a price review. Normally, that's a temporal trigger, so every three or five years. And actually, as buyers and sellers enter the last price review under the long-term contract, actually, it'd be interesting to see whether that affects the approach that is taken if it's perceived as the final roll of the dice under a long-term agreement. Uh, and lastly, looking more to the long-term trends, and this involves a little more crystal ball gazing, but um, uh, I know Chris and Louise are going to come on and talk in a moment about disputes arising out of decarbonisation, but it seems to me that LNG contracts are really likely to operate in a space where commercial agreements between companies interface or interact, interact with national commitments to decarbonisation. And in particular, there's a real focus on the decarbonisation of the LNG supply chain, and that uh, uh, resolves itself in the form of carbon neutral LNG cargo where the emissions relating to a cargo are reduced or offset uh, and this really is I think a, a space to watch in terms of the future disputes because to offset emissions relating to a cargo you obviously have to know what the emissions were you have to be able to measure them who does that and how how's risk allocated in the contract if it turns out that the measurements are wrong and also just in terms of price reviews will this how will this interact with the methodology that's drafted into price reviews? Does the price review mechanism actually allow for a pass through of increased costs of compliance, for example? And how does the risk fall if a party voluntarily decides to incur the increased costs associated with carbon neutral LNG uh, cargoes versus 
it being a sort of imposed obligation at a, at a national level that you have to comply with obligations relating to carbon neutrality. Those are questions to which I'm afraid I have no answer yet anyway. Um, and on the topic of decarbonisation, I'll, I'll pause there and hand over to uh, Chris and Louise to talk, talk you through that. Thanks very much, James. Uh, so Chris and I have the pleasure of speaking to you today about disputes arising from the decarbonisation process. And I'm conscious that this is a topic which has been touched on to varying degrees by a number of other panels this week already. But given the prominence which climate change and issues around carbon intensity have acquired in government policy and increasingly in corporate strategy as well, it obviously wouldn't be right to talk about the future of disputes in the oil and gas sector without addressing this. So before we get too deep into that discussion, I'll start by explaining what we mean by the term decarbonisation. So this is a term that's become a bit of a buzzword in recent years, um, just like sustainability was uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And as this slide illustrates by way of a few examples, different institutions and market players all have a slightly different definition of what decarbonisation means. Um, however, the, the common thread between them all is a focus on the reduction of carbon intensity in a particular area of activity. And while in many circumstances, the drive towards decarbonisation may come from concerns around climate change, there are often also compelling commercial reasons which may motivate this change, including the availability of more cost efficient or energy efficient technology, which is less carbon intensive, uh, or concerns about the long-term risks and challenges in accessing adequate supplies of carbon-intensive fuels. So this is an objective which is being pursued at, uh, to varying degrees by state entities at both national and international levels around the world, um, obviously through the, the Paris Climate Agreement, among others. Um, but it's also being pursued at the initiative of many private corporations and industry bodies, both for policy and commercial reasons. And more recently, the popularisation of initiatives such as ESG investing has led wider stakeholders like funders and financial institutions to take a closer interest in decarbonisation as well. So what we're left with is uh, we're operating within a web of overlapping commitments and strategic objectives and in some cases legal obligations which are driving towards various forms of decarbonisation. And while this is relevant in some way to almost all types of industrial activity, it of course has particularly direct and acute implications for the oil and gas sector. So the process of decarbonisation broadly involves two parallel stages. The first stage is concerned with the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions from existing energy projects through the use of, of new technologies and collaboration with relevant stakeholders. And the second stage is about promoting the use of low carbon and renewable energy sources to replace fossil fuels where possible, and thereby to reduce the carbon footprint of energy production and industrial activity. And from a disputes perspective, both of these stages of decarbonisation give rise to the potential for significant friction between actors in the oil and gas sector on the one hand and government entities, regulators, contractual counterparties and investors on the other hand. And this can manifest in versions of the types of claims with which we're already familiar in the oil and gas sector. So commercial contractual disputes, shareholder claims, conflict with regulators, but it can also manifest in new types of disputes which arise from the novel technical and legal aspects of decarbonisation. Uh, that's next slide, please. So over the next few minutes, Chris and I will take a more detailed look at how this increasing trend towards decarbonisation worldwide is likely to affect the future of disputes in the oil and gas sector, as well as the mechanisms by which we might expect such disputes to be resolved. Now, broadly speaking, as shown in this slide, we're looking at uh, the following potential categories of disputes. So firstly, we have claims against governments uh, by private citizens. So some of the, the kind of uh, most high profile uh, examples of, of these sorts of cases have been brought by groups of private citizens and NGOs in connection with states decarbonisation commitments. So this includes the, the very well known Agenda Foundation case brought against the Dutch government by a group of citizens which successfully sought the imposition of more ambitious carbon reduction targets by the Dutch government. 
another example is that just a few weeks ago, Germany's Supreme Constitutional Court ruled that the government's climate protection measures are insufficient to protect future generations. Um, this was in response to a complaint brought by some environmental groups. And so the court ruled that the government now has until the end of next year to revise and improve uh, the decarbonisation commitments in its Climate Protection Act um, to ensure that it meets its carbon emission reduction goals more immediately. So these sorts of claims against governments have tended to focus on big picture decarbonisation goals. And uh, in many cases, they've been brought by relying on constitutional protections that are available in different jurisdictions. Um, but we've already started to see as well, and will no doubt continue to see, claims by private entities against governments through judicial review mechanisms, human rights legislation or constitutional mechanisms, which seek to challenge approvals for particular oil and gas projects or the award of government contracts to certain companies by reference to states' decarbonisation objectives. And so often these states won't directly involve actors in the oil and gas sector, but they may nevertheless have significant impacts on existing and new projects. And then the second category of disputes that we expect to see is claims against governments by corporations. So this may include challenges to changes in regulation which are introduced in pursuit of decarbonisation policies, uh, which may arise in the domestic courts, but it may also include claims against states under stabilisation clauses in contracts with state entities, or investment arbitration claims brought under international investment agreements or bilateral investment treaties, BITs. So BITs are treaties between two or more states which contain reciprocal undertakings for the protection of investments made by um, parties from each of the states in each other's territories. And they usually guarantee a, a minimum level of, of protection for those investments, which might include a guarantee of fair and equitable treatment of those investments, or protection against discrimination and expropriation. And importantly, these treaties usually give investors the right to bring proceedings directly against a state by way of international arbitration before a, an independent tribunal to seek compensation for the breach of these protections. Um, so a relevant example of one of these sorts of treaties is the Energy Charter Treaty, uh, which has uh, around 47 signatory states. And so these sorts of protections are particularly significant in this context because Decarbonisation efforts by states will typically involve regulatory changes, um, which may be capable of affecting the viability and operation of foreign investments in the oil and gas sector. And uh, so analogous sorts of examples of these type of claims um, include uh, a series of claims that have been brought against uh, a number of European states in connection with the introduction and then later withdrawal of incentives which encouraged investment in solar power and other renewable energy technologies. So we might see more of these sorts of claims uh, in connection with regulatory changes or state actions in pursuit of decarbonisation goals. And something important to note about these sorts of claims is that the protection of an investor's legitimate expectations is a, a core concept in many investment treaty arbitration claims. And in an environment of such rapidly changing policy and regulation, it will be really important for claimants to think about the extent to which they can establish a legitimate expectation of certain types of stability or protection from regulatory change against the background of this increasing decarbonisation drive. Um, and this is something to consider for those who are planning investments for the future now especially. And the third category, which is claims by governments against corporations. So this will mostly concern attempts to enforce regulation um, whether that's in connection with the actual operations in the oil and gas sector as regulatory standards change, especially around decommissioning, or it may be focused on disclosure and reporting requirements or emissions trading rules or, or carbon credits. And then finally, the, the fourth category is claims between private parties. And it's this final category that we think is likely to give rise to the most diverse forms of disputes in this commercial sphere. And so those will be our main focus today. Now, some of these claims may be between actors within the oil and gas sector on the one hand and those outside the sector, um, such as through class actions or, or shareholder actions. But one of the major areas of disputes will be between private entities which are already in contractual relationships and uh, will arise from concerns about how decarbonisation risk is allocated between those parties. And so there'll be various forms of friction which might arise as companies navigate their own energy transition alongside 
changing strategic objectives of their suppliers, their joint venture partners, uh, their customers, as well as their regulators. So it's it's fair to say that this decarbonisation drive is creating rapid changes in the regulatory and commercial landscape. And this is likely to put many long-term contracts under strain, particularly where they were concluded many years ago, where there might have been very different expectations about how the industry would evolve. So parties might find that their warranties and indemnities or their force majeure clauses are not well suited to clearly allocate responsibility for the consequences of the changes that have been created by these public and private decarbonisation drives. And there may also be misalignment between the decarbonisation commitments and, ob and obligations that have been made, uh, for example, even between parties within the same joint venture, which will complicate this further. So I'm now going to hand over to Chris, who will talk about these potential decarbonisation disputes between private parties in more detail. So the next slide, please. Thank you, Louise, and good evening, everyone. Um, as Louise says, then, my job now in the last few minutes today is to try to really spend a few minutes scanning the horizon and trying to, I guess, create some food for thought as to where those areas of friction that Louise mentioned might apply. Um, it's going to be very high level. Obviously, we're not going to mention everything, but as I say, hopefully it will leave you with some food for thought. So then the first area we're going to look at is, is disputes stemming from regulatory changes to try to minimise the carbon impact of existing or new fossil fuel projects. So, for example, maybe new regulatory regimes as to maintenance to reduce flaring or as to vapour recovery or more stringent decommissioning requirements or whatever it may be. I'm sure there's lots that people can think of. Now, now some of this, of course, is not new. We've seen already disputes arising in relation to either actual or future decommissioning liability, whether that's in the form of M&A, uh, warranty type claims, indemnities in different sorts of contractual agreements or, or, or disagreements amongst uh, JOA partners as to how to deal with decom. But obviously, the more the regulatory landscape changes, and the more it changes in different ways in different countries across the world, then the greater scope there is for disputes. And that, that scope, uh, we think, will uh, potentially flourish more if there are more and perhaps potentially unexpected regulatory changes during the operation of assets. Everyone knows that decom is going to happen. You just don't know quite perhaps what the requirements are going to be. But if there are those changes along the way, then that could, as Louise says, create environment, create situations which just haven't been addressed in the relevant contracts. So, for example, as regard contracts with suppliers, if there are new regulatory requirements, can they comply and still deliver um, whatever services they're providing? Or within the JOA, if it's an upstream project, um, uh, for example, how do you address these new these new regulatory requirements? How do you deal with the costs? How does they affect your development plans? Is everyone all on the same page? Well, almost certainly not in every project. And of course, any claim like this is always going to be more complicated if the state is somehow involved at the joint venture level as well. We also wonder if we might start to see contractual termination rights being included in contracts linked to the carbon footprint of the supply. So again, for example, take the supply contract example. Will there be an ability for the customer to, to terminate if the, if the carbon emissions associated with the supply agreement become too great? Um, and potentially also maybe in um, uh, with contracts with lenders or with um, other sources of funding, again, they may be prepared to loan, but will there be some restrictions associated with compliance, with regulatory requirements, but also just generally with minimizing emissions? It's also possible, and there's some examples of this already, but we might start to see tax or incentives or, 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 or negative consequences or subsidies associated with compliance with certain carbon measures um, for fossil fuel projects. Now, of course, that then leads to the scope for disputes, whether or not those incentives are triggered, or if they're not, or if a penalty is triggered, who bears responsibility for that? How do you allocate the cost of that amongst participants, joint venture partners and suppliers. So there we are, that's that slide then. We're going to move next then to um, um, regulatory disputes arising from carbon measurement, reporting, verification and credit trading. Now, this is obviously here. We are seeing already an increased national and regional requirements to report um, uh, carbon, carbon um, emissions output. And also we, of course, have carbon trading. And there's a much greater emphasis across the board now on 
generally on ESG, for example, that was shareholders, but also carbon too. So what could that mean when it comes to our horizon scan? Well, the obvious point is, of course, allocating the cost of carbon in a project. I did a dispute several years ago about the cost of carbon trading in a tolling agreement, who would bear the cost of the permits. Now, of course, it's much more foreseeable now in that context that someone's going to have to bear it. But as these requirements percolate into other contracts where perhaps they haven't been foreseen, you can see again scope for similar dispute about the allocation. Measurement and verification, it's really important to stress that this isn't easy or straightforward. There is an element of subjectivity in the measurement process. The verification measures are increasingly gaining in sophistication. And of course, anything complex creates scope for, for dispute. But also concepts like greenwashing, the idea of giving misleading information about the environment, environmental impacts of either a company's activities or a particular project or a particular contract. Well, could there be contractual liability coming out of that? Could there be claims against suppliers? For example, if a company has to report its own emissions and those of its supply chain, well, then could there be a claim against suppliers if they fail to report properly? Or could this be so important, it's the sort of issue that's coming up, and I'm sure it will be in some situations in the pre-contractual stage. Will there be warranties as to emissions? Could there be potential misrepresentation claims arising out of and linked to this idea of greenwashing, uh, uh, understating what the emissions impact will be? Um, as regards lenders as well, it clearly could well be a live issue there. Will there be events of default when it comes to complying with reporting requirements? And then within JOAs, I think a really interesting area, again, with upstream projects as to how to reflect these regulatory requirements. Will it be the operator's role to measure and verify the carbon impact of a project? How do you deal with that if the, if the participants have different approaches to measurement and how do you deal with it if something goes wrong um, and there is a, a failure in the reporting? And then finally, and I won't mention anything on it, but of course, Louise mentioned the potential for shareholder claims. Um, and of course, about the misleading reporting of emissions data or just the absence of it. And Exxon Mobile, we've already seen um, uh, shareholder class actions in the US about climate change, and certainly we expect increased um, institutional shareholder interest in emissions. Okay, conscious of time then, let's um, move next to uh, the potential disputes stemming from the transition to new new energy, whether it's renewables in the classic sense or new source, new projects such as hydrogen. Louise has already mentioned treaty claims that could arise when it comes to the withdrawal or change to state incentive schemes, so I won't dwell on those now. Um, but what about contractual claims? Well, of course, with any new project, there's always scope for planning and construction disputes. We could spend a lot of time talking about that today and what sort of form they might take and how they might be different from a for example, a traditional um, a gas power plant, but we don't have time, unfortunately, but clearly that's a real um, area of dispute. What about, though, thinking, slightly more blue sky thinking, JB disputes prompted by the fact that many of these deals or new projects may well involve a degree of collaboration between traditional fossil fuel producers and renewable companies or perhaps tech companies, um, whether that's in the form of M&A or some other joint venture or technology sharing arrangement. And, and the reason I think that's really interesting is both because the parties will come from very different backgrounds, very different ways of doing things, um, and clearly some of those collaborations will work brilliantly, but some may not realise quite what they're getting into in terms of the, how the other approaches things. You can see their scope for things to change. But also because there won't, unlike in a lot of the traditional fossil fuel markets, there won't be bespoke contracts um, backed by, sorry, there won't be industry contracts backed by lots of case law and experience. It will be largely, um, largely bespoke arrangements, which again lead to more scope for disputes. Um, and then finally on this topic, these projects may well be backed by green energy funds or by lenders providing green loans and ties back again then potentially to the greenwashing concept of is there scope for claims based on breach of warranties or obligations about emissions or green energy practices uh, regarding the project as a whole and of course that sort of thing would also be a hot area for the project company in dealing with its suppliers and contractors um, both in terms of construction but also ongoing operations finally then um, um, then the transition um, to new energy does go hand in hand with the, the use and development of, of new technology. 
whether that's in relation to the, the project itself, for example, hydrogen. Um, but anyway, the key asset of many renewable companies is proprietary technology. But it could just be with the surrounding infrastructure, interconnectors, storage and batteries, for example, or grid connectivity, and the technology associated with carbon measurement and verification. So, so where then do we see an angle there for, for disputes? Well, again, as with all this, lots of them, so just a few ideas. Um, of course, there'll be lots of potential issues with IP, um, including patent infringement cases, um, but also perhaps associated contractual claims, if there's licenses and the scope of the licenses, the royalties payable. Could we get into a world where there are um, uh, companies with very early stage ideas, protected IP, that are then contracting with someone else who will trial and develop that invention, and then there's an arrangement down the line for royalties if it succeeds, when well, that sort of dispute there's always scope for arguing about well, what are the development obligations, what is the scope of the license, what are the royalties and when are they payable. And then again, um, what if the new tech, if truly new tech becomes a reality? What if we do start seeing widespread battery storage projects um, coming in? Well, obviously we're into real crystal ball gazing there, but in addition to all these issues, then there could well be potentially environmental um, issues coming out of that as well. So um, Rachel, I've, I've rushed through that uh, blue sky thinking given time. Um, so I'll hand back to you, but I hope that's useful for everyone, at least if there's something to think about. Thank you, Chris, very much. And uh, I mean, I think we can already start to see the, the challenges for our colleagues who are busy drafting new contracts and trying to foresee uh, all the new issues that might arise. Um, and you know, going back to where where Simon started, uh, there are clearly decisions uh, coming out of the courts based on the certainty of the text, which is probably not what the parties thought um, it meant in the first place. So I'm sure we will see much more scope for dispute uh, in that area. Um, we are obviously a bit over time, but um, uh, I can't miss my my opportunity to uh, cross examine Mr. Rainey briefly. Oh. Um, <laughs> and we have had some questions. Um, so obviously now we, we've, I'm going to sort of try and, they've been on a theme, so I will, I will try and paraphrase. So we've now obviously had a number of these upstream cases where people have tried to imply terms based on propaganda or, uh, or good faith. Um, but it does seem like uh, if you have a pretty detailed contract negotiated by parties of equal bargaining power and negotiated by lawyers, etc., um, uh, that seems to be very uphill. Is this the death of, of, of Braganza now? Are you actually conversely in a better position if your contract's a bit of a mess? Well, I don't think, I think it's a bit, a bit mean about the contracts. I don't think they are a bit of a mess. I, I think the, the difficulty is importing into contracts uh, implied concepts where the, the contract actually sets out a stipulated procedure. What is unclear? about I, will, I have a right to terminate your appointment on 30 days notice. Uh, why do you need to import uh, uh, um, special considerations? A lot of contracts do have express good faith clauses. Well, that was fine, then you can, you, you can rely upon that. But I think that the difficulty is, is that people are, are really trying to rewrite provisions which are very, very clear and which are very, very simple to apply. And that's why I think the judge was in the um, um, Tacker case was struck by the fact that the operator can walk away without giving any reason at all at six months notice but 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 the, the operator was arguing oh yes well, you can't give me that sort of uh, simple unqualified unfettered notice you have to take into account my interests and and, and try to hold the whole thing together i i, I think it's it, it's a fall on hope I, I don't actually think it's a response to bad drafting i think the drafting is pretty good it, it, it's someone having coming coming up against pretty clear drafting and thinking, well, that can't be right because it damages me very much. Therefore, I'm going to use a, a, a discretion clause. And there's plenty of room for the discretion uh, cases where, where it does actually have not unreasonably fit to be withheld. They, the, the cases are clear. You do have to ex exercise your discretion in a, in a proper way. But there was no discretion in, in, in termination provision in clause 19.1. So where, where was the room to squeeze in, uh, 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 not even a Braganza term, it goes back older than that, a Sosima term, uh, as to exercise in the discretion in a proper way. So um, uh, we'll, we'll continue to see uh, uh, these arguments. And I think we'll continue to see until somebody finally says uh, uh, these contracts either are or are not a relational contract. Mm -hmm. 
the good faith arguments based on Yam Singh. I mean, no one, I think people who trot out Yam Singh never go back to look at what Mr. Justice Leggett said a relational contract really was. You know, he, he was talking about a very, very close exclusive distributorship between two parties where the factory was, was making all the goods to be distributed. They were absolutely interdependent. I don't really think the TPA is a relational contract, but, but, but I reserve the right to argue to the contrary. <laughs> Certainly. I wasn't going to push you on whether you thought JOA was a relational contract. That's an off-the-cuff, off non-binding view. <laughs> Many thanks. Um, well, I'm conscious we, we have run over, so I'm going to wrap up there. But thank you all very much for attending. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to Simon, James, Louise and Chris. Um, there will be a feedback form if you would uh, fill that out. We'd be very grateful. Um, and this, uh, if there's anybody you know who uh, might wish to see this, who hasn't seen it live, it will be available. The recording will be available on our website. So thank you all very much uh, on behalf of HSF Quadrant Chambers and London International Speaks Week. <laughs>